screen. Got it. Yeah, so we're going to go ahead and start. Um, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hi. Yep. Uh, before going further, uh, I'd like to ask permission from Dr. Slane to speak uh, by lingual today. So I might switch Bahasa Indonesia or Indonesian language and then uh, switch English um, if needed. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, kita mulai. Let's start. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Um, puji syukur kehadirat Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala uh, yang telah memberikan rahmat dan hidayahnya sehingga kita semua hadir pada kuliah tamu kali ini. Um, juga kita kirimkan um, salawat serta salam kepada junjungan kita Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu uh, Alaihi Wasallam karena beliaulah sehingga kita bisa uh, tetap di, di jalan yang terang benderang yaitu Islam ya. Um, yeah, so first of all, I'd like to introduce myself to everyone because I believe some students might not know me and also like a few other uh, attendants, attendees. Um, so my name is Rudy. I'm a PhD student here at WVU. WVU stands for West Virginia University. And um, I have been having my five wonderful years here. This is actually my fifth year. It's not quite five years, but it's gonna be my um, fifth year this uh, academic year. And so uh, I would like to thank you and welcome everyone um, to this guest lecture. Um, I also want, you know, I also would like to recognize the speaker, Dr. Slane, Dr. Douglas Slane. Um, which I will introduce in a little bit um, about what he's been doing as a professor here at WVU. And I would like also to recognize the chair of Department of Pharmacy, um, Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Sciences, Tadulako University. And then also a few, uh, some other colleagues, um, the faculty members, of the Department of Pharmacy, since this is pretty much an internal event. So I believe uh, we don't really have like many uh, quote unquote outsiders as in, you know, like um, external guests. Um, and thank you so much for everyone again to be here to make today happen. And um, yeah, before we start our guest lecture, I would like to have Dr. Anam um, to give some opening remarks. Um, and if there are things that you would like to um, say to everyone here, the students, you know, the um, advice that you might want to give them before we go deep inside the pharmacotherapy of pneumonia. Um, and I will turn it over to Dr. Anam, please. Oke, okay. thank you Rudy. Ya, uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, Alhamdulillahirobbilalamin. Bersyukur kepada Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Uh, pada hari ini adik-adik kedatangan uh, kuliah uh, tamu, ya. Dan ini kuliah tamu yang spesial sekali, jauh ya, 12 jam jaraknya. Uh, Lalu juga kita sampaikan selawat dan selawat kepada uh, Nabi Besar Muhammad SAW. Oke, okay, uh, so good morning everyone, uh, good morning, uh, good evening, I, I think so in the US, Dr. Uh, Douglas Lane. Oke, okay, uh, ya. Yeah. First of all, uh, I'm Sariful Anam, Head of uh, Department of Pharmacy, Tadulaka University. Um, I'm very pleased to be able to welcome everyone in our guest lecture in clinical and community pharmacy with topic uh, pharmacotherapy in uh, pneumonia. Uh, before we get started, I would like to express my uh, great appreciation to Professor Douglas Slane, Douglas Slane sorry, 
from uh, School of Pharmacy, West Virginia University, USA, as our guest uh, lecturer. So welcome in Tadulako University, and I'm very pleased and thank you for your time today. And I know, and I uh, also would like thank to Rudy Savarudin, uh, who helped us to make this event uh, uh, come. And I hope the event is become a success today. And as I mentioned in our invitation late, uh, letter, the, the, the goal of the lecture is to edify the students' uh, pharmacotherapy knowledge, especially in uh, pneumonia. And for the student, I hope um, this lecture can benefit with, uh, for you all. And uh, yeah, I, I switch to Bahasa. So, untuk uh, mahasiswa, uh, mohon uh, mengikuti uh, kuliah ini dengan baik, ya. Karena ini salah satu kesempatan yang sangat-sangat uh, luar biasa. Karena uh, tidak tidak semua, tidak gampang untuk menghadirkan uh, apa namanya kuliah tamu yang cukup jauh jaraknya ya kita berterima kasih dengan Pak Rudi karena sudah me, apa arrange acara hari ini ya so at the future I hope we have uh, can uh, collaboration with you Dr Slay ya and and then so I think that's for me uh, for me uh, and then I leave to Rudi to start the lecture and I hope today will be fun and full of learning and once again, uh, thank you very much for Dr. Slain to have uh, our lecture today. So thank you very much. Yep. Yeah, JazakAllah. Thank you so much to Dr. Anam. Um, yeah, before we start our guest lecture, there are things that I need to do. So first of all, I would like to introduce Dr. Slain, just a little bit of what uh, he did in the past, and then uh, what he is doing at the moment. So Dr. Douglas Lane is a professor at the department. Um, I think I just heard something. Excuse me, I'm sorry. So yeah, Dr. Lane is a professor here at WVU uh, School of Pharmacy, the same as the field that we are in, pharmacy. And then uh, he is also the department chairman of the um, pharmacy, the clinical pharmacy department. Um, and then he also serves as an infectious disease clinical specialist at WVU Medicines. Um, I will switch to Bahasa again. Jadi uh, Dr. Slain ini dia uh, spesialis infectious disease atau uh, penyakit infeksi ya yeah. di uh, tidak hanya so it's not only at the school of pharmacy but also at the WVU Medicines Ruby Memorial Hospitals and uh, clinics jadi ada hospital ada rumah sakit juga ada uh, klinik tempat beliau bekerja jadi tidak hanya so he's not only an academia tapi he's also is a he, he, you know, he, he's in the clinical setting as well. And then he received his pharmacy bachelor's of science degree, and then his uh, PharmD degree, or we call it here doctor of pharmacy uh, from Duke University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Itu, it's not too far from here. Uh, Morgantown, West Virginia is like, I would say like one and a half hours, satu setengah jam dari sini. And then he then completed a residency and fellowship in infectious disease pharmacotherapy at the Medical College of Virginia in Richmond, Virginia. Jadi ada, kalau di sini itu ada kayak spesialis after PharmD, ada, ada sekolah setelah itu. And then Dr. Slane also uh, serves as the global affairs uh, liaison for the School of Pharmacy, where he oversees the global health and international activities of the school. Um, so as you guys can see, like he has such a very, you know, like wonderful experience working with international people. So at this point, I would like encourage you all to ask him questions. Um, don't worry about your language and like Dr. Slane will correct me. Um, but I would say like he won't mind if you try to speak English 
um, worst case scenario, if you want to ask, but you're not you know, able to convey it uh, in English, then you can switch to Bahasa, our language. So yeah, and lastly, he has worked as a consultant on many international projects, including serving as a Fulbright specialist scholar in India in 2013. That he, um, apparently, Dr. Klein is also a Fulbright, uh, we call it Fulbrighter, which I also am. Uh, and, you know, Dr. Slane, I came here with Fulbright scholarship, though uh, with the PhD program, we only have like, I know, like only three years scholarship. So right now I'm no longer a Fulbrighter. I'm switching to as a regular um, graduate student. Yep, uh, that's all from me. Um, uh, we, without further ado, uh, as I mentioned to every single student like in this Zoom meeting, please, 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 please ask um, Dr. Slane questions. If you want to speak, um, please raise your hand. We will let you um, to speak directly to Dr. Slane. Or if you are shy, then you can use chat room, which I'm not able to see. I'm sorry. Kaldi, why am I not able to see? Um, chat on my screen. I don't know, but probably I'm missing something here. But yeah, we will we'll take care of that later. Dr. Slane, are you able to see chat? It, it's not one of the options. Yeah, that's what I thought. I don't know. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, I'm, I unactivated the, the chat <laughs> for oh, yeah, the previous event. Yes, <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, uh, okay. That's fine. <laughs> then we have to improvise. So, so all students, if you want to ask, raise your hands. We will let you uh, address the queries, the queries directly. And um, if you want to try to speak English, feel free. If you want to use Bahasa also, uh, you're more than welcome. By all, by all means, please ask questions. Um, and lastly, uh, I'd like to ask permission again from Dr. Slane. Probably I will jump in. Um, after three or four slides, I'll see what I can do because I've, I've gone through all the slides. I might need to kind of quote unquote re summarize just to make sure that they get the point that they need to. Uh, I already told you that like they're able to understand you fully. It's just um, there are things that are available in the US, but it, you know, I need to find like pretty much like a comparable situation or things back home. Okay, uh, without further ado, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you, Rudy. Um, yep. I want to thank uh, Dr. Anam and uh, the, the other faculty for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak uh, to your School of Pharmacy. Um, as Rudy said, you know, I do quite a bit of international work um, I am involved with a lot of clinical pharmacy training uh, in different parts of the world uh, where I serve as a consultant in that role to hospitals and schools of pharmacy. Uh, also, I do some consulting on antimicrobial stewardship, which has become a very important activity that pharmacists are involved in um, throughout the world. And uh, they're really taking a leadership role in antimicrobial stewardship. So I, I tend to do a lot of international um, consulting where I get to go, you know, uh, see different uh, hospitals and talk to clinicians and talk to pharmacists and, and try and give them tips on how to manage antimicrobials better uh, mm -hmm. because we are running out of good alternatives in many parts of the world because of resistance and misuse uh -huh. of antimicrobials. Um, sure. I also want to say that the laptop that I'm working on um, it looks like I'm looking up. <laughs> it's just where the camera is on this laptop. So I'm, I'm looking at the screen so I'll be able to see my, um, either see you or see my slides. So um, let's see, as, uh, as Rudy has mentioned, you know, I do, in addition to being an, a, uh, a faculty member, I do have a clinical practice at our university hospital where I am on a, I'm a part of a team of doctors that we take care of patients with infectious diseases. And I also work uh, sometimes in the outpatient clinic. 
Uh, so uh, I have a, a good, uh, a long uh, amount of experience with it, treating infectious diseases. Now today's talk, I'll really be using slides that I use here to educate the PharmD students in the US, uh, but I've tweaked them a little bit. I know a little bit about Indonesia, just a very little bit. I have not yet been to Indonesia, but I have been to uh, Thailand several times, China several times, Japan, uh, India. So I've been in those countries. I know that there are some practices that might be similar uh, where you guys are, but I still don't have a great sense for how everything is done in Indonesia. I have read a little bit about it. So, um, but you know, this is really uh, more about uh, you know sharing some discussion. Okay. Uh, so, Rudy, I'm going to start the slides. If you want to tell them anything um, in your native language, feel free to while I the slides. Okay. Yeah. Uh, jadi, in short, uh, apa yang barusan Dr. Slane bilang, intinya beliau itu tidak hanya di akademik, tapi juga dia di klinis. Jadi, memang uh, pengalamannya beliau itu pasien sudah uh, apa ya, tidak dipertanyakan lagi. Lah. Jadi, itu perbedaan mendasar antara kita apoteker di Indonesia dan di Amerika. Jadi, um, Dr. Slane is pretty experienced in taking care of patients, specifically in infectious diseases. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Well, uh, just a slide uh, to show how far we are from each other. Um, it's quite a bit of distance, and uh, you know, a lot of, of cultural changes uh, are different. But a lot of things are very similar. Um, we may have some, you know, some different amounts of different bacterias, uh, different types of viruses that, that we may see, but a lot of things are pretty similar despite how far apart we are. Um, I'm familiar uh, with the island that, that your university is from because uh, I know some of the best coffee in the world comes from there. And I am a big coffee fan and I, I actually do drink a lot of coffee from, from your island, actually. So I'm hopeful that the coffee industry there uh, is good for you from an you know, economic and job um, creation. So I hope the coffee industry treats uh, all of you well. Uh, we enjoy your coffee in America, I can tell you. <laughs> okay, so um, this is just a slide, you know, just. People like to see pictures, so uh, I just threw this in. Uh, the top building that you see, uh, that's really uh, what our hospital looks like, but it has grown quite a bit since that picture was taken. That's our university hospital, at least the front end of the building. Uh, it has actually increased uh, since the time that picture was taken. Uh, and then as, it, as I've mentioned, I've practiced and uh, been a visiting clinician in other parts of the world. Um, so um, there's pictures from when I, when I uh, served on patient care rounds at hospitals in uh, China on the lower left and then in um, the United Arab Emirates on the right there. Uh, so I really enjoy getting to see different practices and hopefully someday I can actually visit, visit you in Indonesia and uh, see how things are done there. Yep, you will. Okay, so uh, we usually like to start lectures with, you know, important definitions, right? Uh, so this is a, a definition of what pneumonia is. Um, you'll see very similar definitions to this. It's actually defined as an infection and inflammation of the air sacs in the lung, okay? Uh, which we call those, those sacs alveoli because that, those are important in our respiratory because that's where we exchange CO2 and oxygen. Uh, and this is a cartoon showing you the inflammation um, in pneumonia. Now, pneumonia is very common uh, throughout the world. It's one of the most common diseases in general. Uh, clearly, um, in our country, it's the number one cause of death from an infectious disease in the US and in many other countries as well. You can see that a lot of people get pneumonia and a lot of money is spent on taking care of patients who have pneumonia. And many studies have shown where pharmacists can actually uh, 
lower the costs of care uh, in disease states like pneumonia. So, uh, you know, hopefully you as pharmacists, when you all finish your, your training and, uh, you know, are out working that you can maybe impact um, on the expensive cost of treating patients uh, with pneumonia. The last bullet on this slide, I, I just incorporated a, a fact that I found about Indonesia. Uh, and this is that, you know, pneumonia is a very common cause of childhood death. Um, you know, uh, two children die every hour in Indonesia, and it accounts for 16% of uh, all under uh, year, year five deaths. Uh, and that's an important marker of health for countries especially when you consider countries that are kind of in develop, developing countries. Um, now, a lot of these pneumonias that children get can actually be viral um, and bacterial. So today though, I'm not gonna talk a lot about viral um, pneumonias. I'm gonna talk more about adult bacterial pneumonia uh, more so, okay? Because the reason I'll do that is because we have drugs for that. In viral pneumonia, we don't really have a lot of drugs for viral pneumonia, okay? And that's why we'll focus on adult bacterial pneumonia. Okay, um, Rudy, whenever you think it's a good time to, to do a little translation, just put up your hand like that, and then, uh, then you can do a, a, an interpretation. All right, um, so, in pneumonia, obviously the microorganisms have to get into the lower lung to create inflammation and infection. So the lung, unlike certain parts of the body, it does not have flora, okay? You shouldn't normally have bacteria in your lungs. Your lungs are designed to kind of keep uh, bacteria out of your lung, but the bacteria or viruses or fungus can get into the lung and most of these organisms get into the lung by three different mechanisms. Uh, and these are in no order on this slide. Uh, organisms can get into the lung by being aerosolized. They're floating through the air and you inhale them directly, okay? Mm -hmm. That's how some organisms get into the lung. That is how uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis or the organism that causes TB we aerosolize that, that goes straight into the lung from, from floating in the air. Another way that organisms can get into the lung is through the bloodstream where blood that is, is um, um, blood vessels that are connected to the lungs can actually bring bacteria from the bloodstream and seed into the lung. And then another mechanism where organisms enter into the lung is first your your body is colonized. Your, your upper respiratory tract gets colonized where these organisms live there. Some of them are normal flora. Others are more, they come along and, and they, uh, in some people, they will start to live like in your oronasal pharynx. So up in here, okay, or your GI tract. And then they can get into your lung by what is called microaspiration. So a little bit of saliva can go down and get into your lung or uh, people that can't keep uh, organisms out of their lung, um, the organisms can get in there uh, by overwhelming uh, a patient's respiratory defenses, which I'll show you in a minute. And at the end, when organisms get into the lung and if they're there in a good amount, uh, a, a larger amount of them, uh, they can set up an infection. And then what will happen is, is your body, your lung gets inflamed and it fills with pus and fluid because of your immune system trying to fight those bacteria. And because of all that fluid and pus, the lung doesn't function well and it doesn't exchange oxygen and CO2. So therefore patients can't breathe well and they can suffocate ultimately. Uh, and this is a picture of the alveoli, which are down in your lung. And uh, this is again, where oxygen and CO2 are exchanged. So if that is all filled with pus and fluid, uh, you're not going to exchange your oxygen and CO2 
and a patient won't, won't breathe well and ultimately can die if they don't get care um, that they need. Okay, so uh, Rudy, I don't know, this might be a good place for you maybe to interpret some of the high points that I just mentioned in the pathophysiology. Okay. Ya, uh, jadi pada dasarnya yang tadi disampaikan, intinya paru-paru kita idealnya itu steril. Jadi uh, lungs are supposed to bacteria free. Harusnya, tetapi um, pada kondisi tertentu, apakah dia ter, ter inhale, dia masuk ke dalam uh, saluran nafas, apa namanya, tidak sengaja, kemudian atau mungkin ada sebab lain yang telah disampaikan, dia menjadi infeksi. Nah, karena memang immune system kita ingin melawan, Akhirnya ya muncul tadi ada muncul pas atau semacam kayak nanah atau hasil eh, apa namanya perlawanan dengan dengan eh, bakteri ataupun juga sampai terjadi eh, ada peradangan begitu itu yang eh, menjadi latar belakang pneumonia itu. Yep, that's all. Thank you. Okay, mm -hmm. so I mentioned that your lungs, your lower lungs should be normally don't have bacteria. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes a little bit can get in there. But what protects your lungs are a number of de host defenses that our bodies have. And this slide actually lists um, several things that protect our lungs from things like bacteria. Um, you know, a lot of times organisms can come in, like if you choke on fluid, um, you know, or uh, somebody might, you know, be. Um, passed out or choke on, on vomit um, and bacteria can be in there. Uh, you know, our bodies have like a gag reflex that, that almost will, will kind of protect our airway. We have an epiglottis that covers our airway. Like when we eat food, when we breathe, it opens up. So that epiglottis is, a, is kind of a protective lid to our lung. Um, we have a cough mechanism. So if You know, it feels like uh, sometimes if you're swallowing secretions uh, that might be trying to go into your airway, your, your cough reflex might kick in and, and that might make the organisms and, and really the secretions that might have organism not get into your lung. And part of your airway, you have cells that create mucus that can, um, can if, if, Secretions are trying to come down the, your throat, uh, down into where your lung is. There are cells there that make mucus that can collect anything coming down. Uh, and then you have cells with hair or cilia that project out and they will move in an upward manner. And they, they make that whatever's caught in the mucus go up and out of your airway. Um, this is when, you know, I know this isn't pleasant, but <laughs> If somebody feels like they have to spit up, you know, uh, because secretions, um, that's what's happening. You know, there's a lot of that collecting and people go, Bleh, you know, so yeah. uh, that might happen or people might swallow it. You might swallow it and it goes down into your stomach. So these are all mechanisms that try to keep secretions out of your airway. And it's really the secretions that often might have microorganisms. Now, if organisms can get into the lung, You do have some cells in the lung that can protect you. There are alveolar macrophages, which can fight any organisms that get into the lung. And uh, you have other aspects of your immune system that can help if, if secretions and organisms get into your lung. Now, um, this is a real busy slide, but I just want to make the distinction that there is something called aspiration pneumonia. Um, a better term for that is macro aspiration, meaning that somebody is basically getting a lot of secretions that get into their lung, large amounts. These tend to be people that are, are passed out or that their host mechanisms, defense mechanisms aren't working. Maybe patients that have had a stroke, you know, that they can't, they can't function well. So they tend to, uh, have a large amount of secretions get into their lung. Um, so that's a macro aspiration and that's a better term for what aspiration pneumonia is. Um, and uh, I have some examples at the bottom of, you know, talking about what situations that might occur in. 
And not everybody that has aspiration pneumonia needs antibiotics, but that's difficult for a pharmacist to say. That is something that a, a physician should, uh, should know when and when not to use. So, you know, I, just to maybe be a little bit, get you thinking about a patient, uh, here's a, an example of a patient, okay? This is a 68 year old woman and she comes to a hospital where you're working uh, and you're a pharmacist and she's having difficulty breathing and she's coughing and has shortness of breath. And uh, the time of year is it's late October and uh, she passed out on the ground in front of her house. And when she gets examined in the hospital, it's noted that you know she's somewhat confused. She knows who she is and she knows that she's in the hospital, but she doesn't know what day or time it is. So there is some confusion. Um, it's noted when they listen to her lung that she has uh, what are called decreased breath sounds on both sides of her chest. Um, when they listen in the stethoscope, they hear what are called rails or crackles in both of the lower parts of her lung. Their, her temperature is 38.9 Celsius and her respiratory rate is 20 uh, respirations per minute. Her oxygen saturation is 87% uh, on room air, okay, so she's not yet getting any supplemental oxygen. And then uh, it's noted that her blood pressure is 120 over 80, and she is coughing up some green sputum, okay? So, Rudy, you can, uh, you might need, I might need your help here. Uh, if any students want to give an answer here, um, I, I'd like to know if any of the students can tell me what what looks consistent with pneumonia here and maybe what findings are not normal? Okay, so uh, in summary, jadi intinya dari case yang di depan kita ini, uh, Dr. Slain ingin tahu apakah kalian bisa menyebutkan, jadi semuanya tadi kalian uh, yang sudah mendengar, jadi sebutkan kira-kira hal-hal apa saja yang menjadi Uh, pengarah untuk kasus ini dia mengarah pada pneumonia. Uh, anyone else? Uh, I will try to translate super quick. So uh, 68 tahun, 60 years old, and then uh, dia tidak bisa susah bernafas, kemudian batuk, kemudian dia sesak, sesak uh, kalau bernafas, kemudian uh, she's easily confused, dia agak-agak bingung, uh, disorientasi, Kemudian ada bunyi kayak gemuruh di, di nafasnya, rails, crackles. Kemudian uh, a little bit of fever, um, dia, dia, sorry, 38.9, di 38,9. Kemudian uh, respiratorinya normal, kemudian saturasinya 87, agak-agak berat. Kemudian blood pressure-nya uh, normal, 120. Uh, dengan uh, sputum, lendirnya warna kehijauan. Jadi... Uh, Siapapun uh, mahasiswa silahkan uh, angkat bicara pertanyaannya. The question is, apa yang menurut kalian uh, menjadi hal dari kasus ini yang mengarah pada pneumonia? Silahkan. What are the symptoms or signs that you think that would, you know, uh, wreck this case might be pneumonia, though we're not sure yet. We don't know. So any answers? Ada jawaban? Itu tadi yang di atas ini yang sudah jelas disebutkan saja ini. Anyone? Let me make sure that they are able to hear us. Uh, kami, are you guys able to hear us? Ya, yeah, kedengaran. Okay. Oh, somebody has raised their hand. Somebody. Asrawini Omar. Yeah, just uh, because we're not able to see like who raised their hands, just unmute yourself. 
and then properly I really hope that there's no like background noise. Mudah-mudahan jang, tidak ada suara berisik, tapi silahkan langsung bicara saja. Yes, uh, silahkan. Ada siapa tuh? Ashrawin. Ashrawin. Yes. There you go. Um, um, may I answer, answer the question? Uh, sure. Firstly, sorry if, if my English is, is not so well. So in my opinion, um, maybe the fever, um, the change, uh, the... Uh, she, she's coughing and okay. the sputum color, but we could not say that um, uh, the the women is um, have you know pneumonia because uh, we did we didn't have a clinical death because we should um, do a an diagnosis because uh, like you said before. Um, Pneumonia is caused by back bacteria, so we should um, do a a taste of from his sputum uh, to uh, to to know what kind of infection that he have and do some uh, chest X-ray or CT scan. Uh, maybe it's my answer. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Okay, there you go. Thank you. Um. Yeah, and those are great points that you made. Uh, your English was fine uh, and you made very good points. So some of these symptoms could be pneumonia, but there's nothing in this picture that tells us 100% that this is pneumonia, okay? Um, I will go through some of the you know, things that we use to diagnose in a couple slides from now, but you know, remember this case because when we talk about the diagnoses, um, we'll talk about, you know, how good are some things and how unique are they to pneumonia. So we will, I just want you to remember this lady, this case of this lady. Also, a couple of things that I won't get into is, that pharmacists should be involved with is notice that she is smoking cigarettes, okay? Uh, smoking cigarettes is not good in general. So a pharmacist hopefully uh, could be involved in smoking cessation for this for this patient eventually, um, because uh, that could really be a way to prevent a lot of uh, problems, uh, COPD, pneumonia. I mean, this patient could have COPD. This might not even be pneumonia. Um, also, uh, the time of year. Now, in America, if somebody presented like this, you know, we would start to worry about you know early influenza we would start to talk about immunizations. I'm not gonna talk a lot about immunizations at all, but remember that some immunizations can prevent certain pneumonias. Uh, the influenza vaccine can prevent influenza, which is a pneumonia, and the streptococcal vaccine can also prevent um, a common cause of pneumonia, streptococcal, uh, pneumococcal um, infection. So we'll, cut, we'll talk um, about diagnoses and remember this patient when we do that. So a person like this, you know, when they come in, you have to think about many causes. Okay, first of all, is it infectious? Is it pneumonia? Is it COPD? But it could be other, it could be, um, it could, it, you know, in your part of the world, you have to think about the organisms that are prevalent if it is something infectious, okay? Uh, where I'm working, we may have certain organisms we see. Where you are in Indonesia, you have certain organisms you see uh, that cause respiratory infections. Now, for the most part, they overlap a little bit, but the percentages can be quite different, okay? For example, in your part of the world, you would have more risk of somebody having tuberculosis than in the US, okay? I could still see someone in the US with tuberculosis, but it might be more common in Indonesia. Um, you could see someone coming in from the community with Acinetobacter causing a pneumonia. It would be very rare in America for someone to come in from the community with Acinetobacter, okay? Um, you have to think, could it be influenza? Uh, now, is it COVID, right? Uh, this, where we are right now, everybody with a respiratory uh, situation would probably be evaluated for COVID. So um, 
there's a lot of things that can either create lung problems or in lung infections. It's a big list. So when we diagnose somebody, you first look at the clinical presentation. So this is where our patient had uh, several of the issues listed here, okay? Did she have a fever? And um, the, uh, the student that answered suggested that the temperature, I believe, was a fever. So yeah, uh, the patient did have a fever. Um, so that's just a sign that you know it's consistent with infection, but by itself, it is not diagnostic of an infection per se uh, or pneumonia by itself. Now, I did not give you any lab work to show you that the patient had a white count, white blood cell count that was elevated or that they had a shift to the left. That would be indicative of maybe a bacterial infection. Uh, patients can have a lot of vague symptoms like shaking, chills, pleuritic or chest pain. Um, those would be uh, some, again, they could be from other things, not just pneumonia. But the more of these things you see together, you start to think about pneumonia. Um, low bar consolidation would be something that uh, if they did a chest exam, the lung doesn't sound as wide open, as airy as it normally would. It, if they listen to the lung with a chest exam, it sounds dull, like there's fluid in it. Um, and there's a consolidation, okay? So that would be a finding that they could see uh, with a stethoscope listening. Uh, other vague things, uh, shortness of breath, cough, uh, producing sputum or, or a change in color. Um, you know, our patient had a green sputum, but what if they have green sputum all the time because they smoke or have COPD? But if it looks different than normal, then you have to think maybe there could be pneumonia. Um, hypoxia. Our patient was hypoxic, okay, because the oxygen satur saturation test should normally be at least 95%. And hers was, I think, 80 something, 87. Seven. Yeah, so she was a little hypoxic. Um, interestingly, um, oh, I'll get to it. Um, no indication of dehydration, but that's often seen, especially in elderly patients with pneumonia the immune system and hydration might go in, in line with pneumonia. Uh, altered mental status, our patient had a little bit of that. And that's, that doesn't mean pneumonia automatically, but it's oftentimes it's part of the way somebody might present. And then lastly, are they septic? You need to look at all their vital signs. We looked at their fever, their temperature, but look at their blood pressure, okay? Look at their respiratory rate. Now that patient's respiratory rate was high, so they would be tachypnic. But I thought it was interesting in that case, her blood pressure was not low, okay? It was 120 over 80, which is really normal, which is, you know, maybe she's someone that normally has hypertension, uh, but that was, wasn't so low that she lo looked like she was in septic shock. Um, if she would, would be, she would go to the intensive care unit if it was very low, but hers was not. Rudy, I don't know if you wanna- uh, After this it. slide. Okay. All right. So um, there are people that have a higher risk of getting pneumonia. This is not, there are some other factors, but these are some common factors. People that are at higher risk, the elderly, um, people that drink excessive amounts of alcohol, uh, smokers, like um, like our patient was, uh, patients with asthma or even COPD, e patients that are immunocompromised, and people that have altered consciousness, um, people that have had like mini strokes, uh, seizure disorders, head traumas, people have received anesthesia because they're um, a lot of their... Um, their nerves that innervate some of those host defenses are altered, they might be at a higher risk of, of getting um, secretions into their lung and getting pneumonia. Uh, people that have a lot of aspiration. And then people that have 
certain chronic disease states have higher rates of pneumonia, such as diabetes and congestive heart failure um, and COPD. Uh, those are just some examples. Okay. Dr. Slane, could you, yeah, could you please go back to the previous slide before the risk factors? Yes. <clears throat> So uh, the summary of this slide, uh, adik-adik sekalian, jadi ini clinical presentation. Jadi rata-rata kalau orang kena pneumonia, ini adalah dia punya uh, kemungkinan-kemungkinannya. It's not always, you know, like these patients have to have like every single clinical um, symptoms or sign yang ada di sini, tapi bisa jadi tiga, bisa jadi lima, dan seterusnya. Tapi ini adalah pengarah sekali lagi. Saya sudah jelaskan sebelumnya ya. Jadi ada demam, leukocytosis, atau tingginya... Uh, sel darah putih di atas 10.000 uh, mili uh, di 10.000 sel per milimeter kubik, kemudian uh, menggigil, kemudian ada chest pain atau nyeri dada, kemudian ada lower consolidation. Tadi sudah dijelaskan ya, jadi kayak merasa kayak ada di kalau di evaluate dengan stetoskop itu ada bunyi dal, kayak uh, bunyi tumpul, kayak ada uh, apa namanya? Sorry, I'm hearing like echo. I might, if, if, could you, I really hope everyone put themselves on mute. Yeah, I'm okay now. I'm sorry, guys. Yeah, uh, ada deep snare, uh, susah bernafas, kemudian cough, batuk, ada sputum, uh, color change, ada ber berwarna, kemudian dia rendah oksigen, kemudian dehydration, atau tidak ada kayak, kayak mulai, kalau dehydration itu biasanya juga kehilangan ini, apa mulai confuse begitu, dia mulai bingung-bingung. Nah ini ada tadi yang septic appearance tampilannya, ada yang takipnya, takikardi sama hipotensi atau rendah rendah tekanan darah. Uh, next slide please, Dr. Slane. Nah uh, these are ini adalah risk factors, uh, so factors that are associated with pneumonia. Jadi ini yang kayak orang-orang uh, kalau punya ini bisa lebih they have higher probability of kayak begitu. Jadi dia uh, apa namanya uh, pokoknya ini punya lebih kemungkinan lebih tinggi untuk me, terkena pneumonia. Uh, elderly orang tua, kemudian orang dengan alkohol, dia merokok, orang kena asma, uh, HIV patients with uh, in immunosuppression atau yang rendah imun, kemudian RCVA cerebrovascular yang kue gangguan sebentar to stroke, seizures, uh, gang, apa? concussion, head trauma, atau apapun itu, kemudian high volume aspiration, kayak aspirasi, volumenya itu tinggi, dan uh, komorbiditasnya uh, lebih dari satu, begitu. Kalau misalnya dia, dia banyak penyakit penyertanya, makin rentan terkena infeksi, simpelnya begitu. Oke, okay, I'm done, Dr. Slane. Oke. Okay. So, how do we diagnose pneumonia? All right. First is look at those clinical signs and symptoms you know, that we talked about already. Um, then you can look at laboratory work if you have lab access. So looking at the white blood cell count to see if it has gone up and to see if there's a left shift. Uh, left shift means that there's a higher than normal amount of the immature white cells or the band cells. Uh, one of the main ways that we diagnose pneumonia though is by x-ray. Um, it, it's probably one of the more important tools. Uh, so in addition to the clinical signs and symptoms, x-ray is usually a key part of that. In rare situations, they may do a chest CT. Uh, that's more expensive and that's only used um, in certain situations. You might find a pneumonia on chest CT, but the more routine thing is a x-ray. Chest exam, um, As I've mentioned, if you he hear them talking about crackles or rails on auscultation um, with a stethoscope, uh, those are findings that are common. If they um, do a chest exam and they, they kind of uh, tap on, on their back or their front in the lungs, uh, they'll talk about a dullness. That's because the lungs are less um, airy. They're filled with liquid and pus, so they might be more dull. Uh, and those are seen on chest exam. Now, on this slide at the bottom, I have a link that you can review in your own time uh, just to see some of the chest exam tests that are done. 
uh, so you know what I'm talking about. You'll see real, uh, you'll see them. Um, other things that can be done, sputum or respiratory secretions can be collected. They can be gram stained in the micro lab or uh, see if they can grow in culture. But remember, you generally want to do that before anyone gets antibiotics because getting antibiotics can limit the ability to find bacteria that might actually be there. In really sick patients, they will also tend to collect blood to see if the bacteria might be growing in the blood as well. Um, in some rare situations, you have other tools, uh, a bronchoscopy, which I'll show you a picture of. That's mainly done in hospitalized patients, usually pretty sick patients, uh, or maybe HIV patients, they might do it. A tracheal aspirate, again, is done a lot in hospitalized patients. Uh, we talked about pulse oximetry, that, that you can do anywhere. Uh, blood gases can be done. Uh, they have to put an arterial line to do that. Uh, that can give you some information um, about oxygenation and then we have some other tests like the urine antigen test uh, for organisms like strep uh, pneumoniae. And uh, we have an organism called Legionella uh, pneumophilia. And I don't know if that is common in uh, Indonesia or not, but we have another- Not that I know of. Yeah, I don't know if it is. We have an, another urine test for that. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a newer test. and. I do believe that some people have access to this in some of the Indonesian hospitals. Uh, it's a lab test called procalcitonin. And it's, it's used a lot in America and in Europe uh, and other, other uh, countries. It's not a perfect test, but it is a, it's a hormone that tends to be secreted in higher levels when somebody is experiencing certain bacterial infections. And its predictive value um, is not great in all types of infectious diseases, but one area that it does pretty good in is in lung infections like pneumonia. So you can see how we, how we might use this. Somebody could come in and we're not sure if they have pneumonia. Maybe all those diagnostic tests aren't clear and we don't know if we wanna start antibiotics. We might want to hold off on giving antibiotics because we're worried about over-treating with antibiotics. If someone has you know, COPD exacerbation, maybe we don't need to give them antibiotics, okay? Um, or if it's something non-bacterial, we don't want to give them antibacterials. You know, if it's a viral pneumonia, for example. So this is a test that can be used maybe to help you think if it's likely to be a bacterial infection. So I think if you look at this, you can see that, I don't know, I don't think, will my pointer work? Yeah, 0.25 has been kind of a key cutoff. If somebody has a, a procalcitonin that's 0.25 or higher, then it's, it's a higher likelihood that they're experiencing a bacterial infection. Therefore, we would probably start antibiotics. If it were much lower, uh, then it's less likely that we need to start antibiotics unless they were septic. If they're really critically ill and septic, uh, they might get antibiotics. But at least you can see this is a nice algorithm for how we use uh, this unique uh, test. Uh, in yep. some parts of the world, they may also use... Um, um, <clears throat> C-reactive protein. C-reactive protein is a very non-specific inflammatory marker, and it's inexpensive, so a lot of countries use it, but it's not a great marker. Uh, this is a little bit more specific for deciding if somebody might have a bacterial lung infection. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, in short, with, with this slide, uh, I don't think that I need the previous slide, Dr. Slane. It was pretty straightforward. Yang sebelumnya itu, uh, tadi yang diagnosis itu sudah jelas ya, uh, Tadi dan juga the apa wordings semuanya juga it's easy to digest. But this one for this slide, um, what I want to highlight, apa yang ingin saya sampaikan adalah procalcitonin ini yang uh, sering dipakai di Amerika dan di Eropa. 
dalam konteks karena ini dia penanda dia lumayan bagus walaupun memang tidak 100% juga tapi dia lumayan bagus dan cut off-nya adalah 0,25. Jadi ini penanda kalau misalnya prokalsitoninnya dia less than uh, 0.25 dia di bawahnya itu maka uh, as you guys can see antibiotic is not really encouraged. Dia tidak sebaiknya jangan pakai antibiotik kalau dia di atas 0,25 kita mungkin kemungkinan uh, antibiotik diperlukan gitu. Um, yep. um, Dr. Slain, before we go further, um, you know, considering the number of slides you have and um, you know, calculating time right now it's almost it's it's nine already and uh, we might wanna i think i'll just go three four five slides maybe that way you know save time and then go over every single start slide yeah some of the ones at the end rudy um i wasn't even sure if i would address them um okay i and some i won't i'm really going to kind of not spend a lot of time on so i understand okay so uh this is just a slide just talking about there are different ways we can collect respiratory specimens we can get somebody to, to cough up sputum. Um, that is usually kind of a dirty specimen that could pick up bacteria from the upper airway. That may not tell you bacteria that are down in your lung. Um, a tracheal aspirate or a suction are, are things that they can uh, suck up some secretions in hospitalized patients. These are just some diagnostic tools I'm showing, that's all. Mm -hmm. The, uh, so I mentioned bronchoscopy. This is mainly done in, in uh, hospitalized patients or maybe like HIV patients uh, because it is delivering a fiber optic tube into the lung at the site on an X-ray where an X-ray looks like there's a, a opacity where the infection might really be bad. They can deliver this fiber optic tube and get a sample, okay? Mm -hmm. So that's what bronchoscopy does. And there are two different types of tests. One is called the BAL, which is the bronchial alveolar lavage, or there's a one that has a brush that swabs in your lung and it brings a sample. Um, this is a very invasive way of getting a secretion from the lung. Uh, but the good thing is, is it doesn't get tainted from your oral nasal pharynx. You're not, it's not like sputum that's coming up out of your, your mouth which can have bacteria. Um, so you wanna know what bacteria are in the lung. Uh, and we might do this in hospitalized people where we're having difficulty treating them. Uh, this I just is wanna just clarify, Dr. Slane, uh, yeah. in the previous slide, uh, like are these, no, the previous, yeah, that one. So are these procedure conducted in unconscious patients only or like they could also be done you know, in conscious yeah, ones. They still have a level of consciousness that they kind of give a, a sedation to them. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So in short, teman-teman um, semua, jadi ini adalah the diagnostic tools. Jadi bagaimana caranya kita uh, apa menegakkan diagnosanya bahwa ini adalah uh, pneumonia yang tadi yang bronco, bronco alveolar lavage, ada yang protected specimen brush. Jadi ini salah satunya yang in, yang yang memang relatif kayak terlalu Invasive itu kayak kasar. Saya dulu tidak tahu bahasa Indonesia. Jadi pokoknya main main berat kali begitu. Jadi intinya ini hanya uh, alat untuk diagnosa. Yep dan uh, this is just a picture of the brush one. It swabs in the lung and that can go to the lab to see if there's something growing there. I see. Um, this the students probably don't need to know this but it just tells us that you want to see a certain amount of bacteria before you call that a significant finding in the lung. There could be a little bit of bacteria that show up on one of those bronchoscopy tests, but you have to have a certain amount before they would say it's a significant amount to be worthy of consideration. That's all this slide is showing. Um, we don't want to, people can be colonized. Their upper airway, you can have in your mouth, you can have a very scary organism. You can have Acinetobacter, which is very multi-drug resistant. And if you find that, it doesn't mean that you have to treat that unless you think that it's actually causing a pneumonia. 
Okay. So pneumonia treatment is, is very challenging because you don't want to just give antibiotics to everyone, only those that truly need it. And diagnosing pneumonia can actually be pretty difficult to say exactly what bacteria or what non-bacteria is causing it. And that's what this slide is saying. It might be easy for a doctor to say, yes, this patient has pneumonia based on their signs and symptoms and x-ray, but saying for sure what the organism is, is difficult because the micro results aren't always clear. So you'll see when I show you the treatment recommendations, a lot of them are empiric. We start giving an empiric regimen that we may or may not change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have to talk about that because that's basically the point of this whole presentation, I would say. Could you please go back to the two line slide of yours, the previous one? Yep. Um, did it, I, no, not that one. Let's explain the next one. Yep, this one. Um, seperti yang bisa dilihat ya, uh, untuk mendiagnosanya itu relatif easy, mudah. Tetapi etiology, bagaimana kita menentukan bakteri yang menginfeksi, itu sulitnya minta ampun. Kadang-kadang kala uh, apa dari hasil mikronya itu tidak me, tidak langsung mudah. Oke, okay, ini bakteri yang menginfeksi begitu. Sehingga dalam uh, moving forward in the slides and the way you know like clinicians treat ke, ke yang bagaimana caranya uh, apa orang-orang di klinik itu menangani pasien itu dia uh, selalunya itu uh, apa mengarah diawali dengan empiric dulu jadi uh, empiric is basically based on you know pengalaman-pengalaman se sebelumnya dan secara sederhana sebelum kita tahu before we know like the specific bacteria infecting the patients yang kita belum tahu bakteri spesifik yang menginfeksi pasiennya. Um, yep, that's on. Okay, that leads perfectly to this slide. So, in America, if a person comes into the hospital or into a doctor's office or clinic with pneumonia, uh, I'm not talking about people that have been in hospitals, somebody in the community, and they have a pneumonia, um, we would give empiric treatment for the first five organisms on this slide, because those are the ones we see most often in, the, in America, in USA. Um, so most of the empiric regimens you'll see have some activity against all five of those organisms. The organisms below the line, uh, the dotted line here, uh, these are rarer, okay? Or Notice that viruses can also still be pretty prevalent. Uh, and we don't, there's no drugs that treat viral pneumonia, really. Um, there are some anti-influenza drugs, but other than that, uh, we don't really have drugs. So empiric community-acquired pneumonia treatment is targeted at these top five organisms. Um, you may or may not have some of those. I don't think you have Legionella where you are. Um, mm -hmm. I looked at Indonesia and I have some slides coming up that point that you have some different organisms. So. Mm -hmm. um, there are some organisms that we call atypical organisms. Uh, these are the three that we tend to see in the U.S. Uh, you do see chlamydophila, which could be chlamydia pneumoniae. Uh, that is in Asia. And I think mycoplasma might also be in in uh, in uh, your region of the world as well. These are atypical pneumonia agents. And you know, in our country, most of our empiric regimens have some activity against them. This is the one that causes most pneumonias, uh, the highest percentage. And this is strep pneumo or the pneumococcus. Um, there are just some figures here. Uh, it can create a lot high mortality associated with it. And the good news, though, is there are, in our country, we have now three vaccines to treat it. And again, pharmacists in our country are very active in, in promoting vaccinations and administering vaccinations. Uh, and this can actually lessen somebody's chance of getting pneumonia. Okay. But strep pneumo can also be drug resistant. This is a very busy slide, okay? Um, I don't want you to really memorize the slide. Um, 
But the takeaway is this. Um, if you have a strep pneumo that is, you know, not resistant to penicillin, then it usually has a lot of different drugs that it would be susceptible to. Notice that all those drugs listed here um, in this first column, if you have a pretty sensitive strep pneumo, you can often consider any of those drugs there. But some of the strep pneumo become multi-drug resistant. So as they get more traits of resistance, um, especially to the beta-lactams or penicillins, um, then they'll become resistant to other classes of drugs. And that's all this slide is, is meant to show you, that this is an organism that can develop um, some multi-drug resistance. Haemophilus influenza, this is one we'll see in America, in particular in people with COPD, uh, some diabetic patients, um, maybe some asthma patients. And um, I do believe in your country, you'll see this one as well. Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of drugs that can treat Haemophilus influenza, that's the good news. But it is an organism that sometimes does make a beta-lactamase. So that means that you can't use drugs like amoxicillin um, if it is uh, a beta-lactamase producing strain. This one is not as common, uh, Morexella catarallis, I'll just skip that. Chlamydophila is an atypical bacteria. Now, one thing to remember, all of the atypical bacteria, at least in America, we have the same four classes of drugs that treat them. So every empiric community acquired pneumonia regimen has one of these drugs in a regimen empirically. And it's because these are the classes of drugs that will treat the atypical pathogens. Now, uh, this chlamydophila or chlamydia pneumoniae, uh, this is one that can cause some milder pneumonias that patients that don't get admitted to the hospital might get. Uh, this is similar. Uh, mycoplasma, a lot of people might get a pneumonia that don't need to be in a hospital. Some do go to the hospital. But notice that the drugs we use are all pretty similar. Notice that none of the atypical drugs are beta-lactams. That should be an important observation that you make. And you remember, hopefully, the I'm sure the class now knows what beta-lactam antibiotics are from other lectures, yeah. maybe? Mm -hmm. They do. Okay, good. All right. Um, so the beta-lactams are not good against the atypical bacteria. So that's why we tend to need to have one of them in, in a regimen for empiric coverage or definitive treatment. I'll skip over Legionella. Okay. Um, this is just a slide showing you that different conditions that people have might make them prone to different uh, bacteria that might not be common. Uh, for example, somebody that has, has influenza, they have a higher chance of actually getting a Staph aureus pneumonia. And Staph aureus isn't a common cause of community-acquired pneumonia. Um, but if you had influenza first, it would become a more important cause, a secondary um, bacterial pneumonia. Um, this is a busy slide, um, and I won't go into the detail, but just to say that people that give you sputum, oftentimes it's just really what's, it's like spit. It's like upper airway and it's not coming from their lung. So to decide if a sputum is kind of more useful, we like to see where there is, um, we want to see where there is a low amount of epithelial cells, like less than 10 on a lab work, or there are a lot of PMNs, PMN uh, white cells, like more than 25, okay? Uh, that tells us that the specimen might have come from the lung rather than the mouth, and that um, it might be at a site of infection if there's a lot of PMNs present. Okay, Rudy, this might be a good place for you to do any kind of interpreting. Are there any slides you want me to go back to? Um, yeah, if you don't mind, we can just go over super quick, starting from the, yeah. Oh, 
that's where we stopped last time. Yeah. So basically, in this like, saya dalam bahasa ini, I will talk 100% in bahasa. So, yang ini, yang garis yang bagian atas itu yang paling dominan, yang paling prevalent, yang paling banyak uh, ditemukan, dan ini yang rata-rata diterapi secara empirik. Yang bagian bawah itu tidak. Next, next slide. Nah, ada yang namanya atypical pneumonia. Ini yang yang tidak nor, yang tidak biasa begitu. Jadi ada yang tipe-tipenya itu ada tiga, mycoplasma uh, pneumonia, dan ada dua yang di, di bawahnya. Jadi ini yang tidak biasa. Uh, jadi memang kalau kita bicara infectious disease itu tergantung dari bakterinya, dan ini yang masuk kategori tidak biasa, atypical. Kalau ada yang satunya lagi, typical. Next, satu selain. Uh, ini yang paling banyak. This is the most uh, common uh, bakteria yang menginfeksi. Jadi Streptococcus pneumoniae uh, sudah dijelaskan ya uh, bahwa ini yang paling banyak dan juga uh, this is one of the things. I'm sorry, I, I switch back to English again. Um, this is one of the things that we are so proud of. Uh, you know, pharmacists in the US karena vaksin. Jadi untuk vaksin untuk si uh, Streptococcus pneumonia itu sudah uh, ada dan uh, pharmacists are playing such a very wonderful role. Bagus sekali perannya untuk me, me, me tackle, me, apa ya, menangani uh, infeksi ini. Jadi with the vaccination, the infection rate is just going down for sure. Uh, next slide, Dr. Slain. Uh, this is basically ini ini pada dasarnya yang daftar antibiotika yang uh, rentan sekali um, apa namanya jadi yang kalian lihat judulnya di atas ya kerentanan dari streptococcus pneumoniae uh, pada masing-masing antibiotika jadi ada di situ amoxicillin sampai vancomycin dan di situ ada apa namanya uh, MIC minimum inhibitory concentration di sini intinya yang disampaikan tadi Dr. Slain tentang uh, kalau kita lihat, jadi memang amoxicillin itu rentan. Apalagi kita di Indonesia ya. In Indonesia, amoxicillin is being used probably too much. Itu menjadi, it, it becomes one of the big challenges that we have in the um, apa, the use of antibiotics. Next slide, Dr. Slain. Yeah, amoxicillin actually may be better to use than some others though. <laughs> some situation. <laughs> And then hemophilus influenzae. Uh, ini adalah infek, uh, infeksi bakterinya, kemudian yang bawahnya ampicillin, cephalosporin, fluoroquinolone, such as um, ciprofloxacin, and then levofloxacin, and so on. Ini pilihan-pilihan obatnya, begitu. Jadi biasakan adik-adik sekalian untuk mengenali obatnya ya, uh, yang beta lactam, uh, kemudian yang uh, apa jenis-jenisnya itu, ke carbapenem, tiger cycline, sama uh, TMP SMZ, or we call it cotrimoxazole, combination of trimetoprim and sulfamethoxazole. Ini biasakan, jadi familiarize yourself with these type of drugs, and these drugs, ini adalah obat-obat yang digunakan untuk hemophilus influenzae. Uh, I think the next ones, we'll, we can just skip them. Uh, yep, that's done. Selanjutnya, next. Mycoplasma, it's fine. Next. Yes, this one. Uh, clinical condition and likely pathogens. Ini um, intinya bakteri, uh, sorry, mikroorganisme yang uh, rentan untuk mengenai si pasien, kelompok-kelompok pasiennya dari yang uh, HIV patient, immunocompromised host. Uh, itu ada pneumos, uh, ada yang itu ya, pneumocytis, uh, cystis yang karini, And then fungi dan ada bawa-bawanya kemudian COPD, uh, hemophilus influenzae dan seterusnya. Jadi dengan mengenali bakteri-bakteri yang me menginfeksi si pasien, kita bisa mengarahkan uh, apa antibiotika yang uh, baik begitu, yang tepat begitu. I just told them that um, you know knowing the um, types of bacteria infecting the patients. You know, help us a lot. You know, recommend antibiotics for the patients. And then next, I believe that's yours now. Oh, no, it's not. It's it's on. I'll just skip it. You already explained that. It's a busy slide. Anyway, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're almost done. Okay. Uh, so we're we're now. Um, I'll talk about the approach to treating patients with pneumonia. Um, you know, it 
some of this stuff is really more for a US audience. Um, you know, typically a patient will be sick. They'll be evaluated either at a doctor's office or at a hospital. They can decide if somebody needs to be admitted to a hospital. If you're admitted to a hospital, you would be started on uh, and found to have uh, pneumonia, you would get intravenous antibiotics. If you didn't get admitted you, and you were outpatient, you would get oral antibiotics to start. Um, some people that start on IV antibiotics in the hospital will be converted to oral and sent home. This is just a list of drugs that could be considered uh, for the treatment of community acquired pneumonia. Mm -hmm. And they're in different groupings. Okay. Um, notice that on the previous slide, aminoglycosides were not listed there, okay, for drugs for community acquired pneumonia. You won't see aminoglycosides there. It turns out aminoglycosides are not great lung antibiotics. Um, they, they don't penetrate well into the pulmonary tissue. They need active transportation. And normally the pH in a lung infection also hinders that. So that's uh, one of the reasons why we don't tend to like to use aminoglycosides for community acquired pneumonia. Uh, there are some pneumonia patients that will get aminoglycosides though, and I'll talk about them later. But in general, we don't use them for community acquired unless there was an organism that was resistant to everything else, okay? So um, in the US, we have a number of guidelines that help clinicians decide what is the best you know, way to treat patients, what are prudent empiric regimens. So most of our guidelines come from the American Thoracic Society, working in concert with the Infectious Disease Society of America. And there's a, there's a citation to the guideline there. Okay. So the way that the, these guidelines work for treating a person with community acquired pneumonia is first you have to assess, does this person have any comorbidities that put them at risk for not doing well with pneumonia or even potentially having more resistant organism. So that's a question you have to know your patient. You know, if it is an otherwise healthy person, you're going to treat them different maybe than someone that has some of the things listed on this slide. So uh, that's, that's kind of an important slide to look at. Well, are any people in the community at risk for having MRSA, a methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, or Pseudomonas? There are some rare situations where that might be the case. Uh, if so, you may need to add uh, coverage to their, to their regimen, their antibiotics, if you're worried about that. But right now, we're talking about community-acquired. Uh, and in that situation, these organisms are very rare. Now. In Asia, um, you have more of a prevalence of Acinetobacter bomania. And this is a problematic organism because it's kind of an environmental organism. It's multi-antibiotic resistant. Um, you have to decide if someone is just colonized or if they are infected. So um, it can be a real challenge in treating someone with, with uh, Acinetobacter uh, Bomonii or some of the other Acinetobacters. And it becomes increasingly problematic if it is carbapenem resistant, which we've called CRAB. Um, and if that's the case, you have to consider, you know, some other drugs and combinations and maybe even nebulizing drug. Uh, it can be quite problematic. So this is what this is from the American guideline. So if someone is treated outpatient, meaning they're not admitted to the hospital, they're out in the community, they have a pneumonia, you're not sure what the organism is that's causing the pneumonia, this is what would be recommended to a patient. So if they don't have any of the comorbidities I showed you or risks for MRSA or Pseudomonas, you could just give them amoxicillin, okay? Um, or doxycycline, 
or maybe a macrolide. But most people, if they were going to use a macrolide, they would use azithromycin. They would not use erythromycin. Um, and that's what you would get. Those regimens would do well on strep pneumo, um, some H flu, not a lot of H flu, but, but the risk of getting H flu in that population would be less. Um, some of the agents there have a typical coverage. The only one that does not is amoxicillin. So that's kind of like the lone one that doesn't have an atypical uh, coverage. Now, if someone had some of those comorbidities that I listed before, then they would get a different empiric regimen. They would get something like amoxicillin with clavulanic acid or a second or third generation oral cephalosporin in combination with either a macrolide or doxycycline. Uh, that second drug would be there for atypical coverage. The first drug is there in case they have a bad strep pneumo or an H flu or something. And then if you don't wanna use that regimen, um, the other choice would be give them a single regimen of a fluoroquinolone like levofloxacin, all right? Um, not ciprofloxacin, but something like levofloxacin that has um, strep pneumo activity. So those would be how we would treat someone in America empirically if we didn't have a good sense for what was causing it. Now, what about if they got admitted to the hospital, if they were sick enough? These pe generally people would get a beta-lactam IV and it would typically be something like ceftriaxone or you know, it could be uh, ampicillin, sulbactam. Uh, it could even be piperacillin, tazobactam, but that would be rare to use that unless you were worried about pseudomonas. And then you would give that in combination with a macrolide uh, or a fluoroquinolone or even doxycycline. So that's how hospitalized patients would typically get treated in the US. And again, I'm just talking about community acquired pneumonia, not people that have been in the hospital. So this is our approach. So I found a nice article that talked about Indonesian guidelines for community acquired pneumonia. I looked for newer ones. These go back to 2003 but I do get the sense that this is probably similar to what is done. Um, their approach in some ways is similar. So this is just for people being admitted to the hospital, not outpatient. So wards, people not sick enough to be in the ICU, they would get an IV beta-lactam and it would be with a beta-lactamase inhibitor. So that would be something like Unison maybe. Uh, or ampicillin, sulbactam, one of those kinds of drugs, or a first or, or I'm sorry, a second or third generation cephalosporin. I gave the example of ceftriaxone would be ours. And then another option could be a respiratory fluoroquinolone by itself, like levofloxacin. And then you could decide to add a macrolide to options one and two if you were worried about an atypical organism. So in many ways, it's very similar to the US's options. Um, some subtle differences. Intensive care treatment though, uh, the Indonesian guidelines are a little bit different, uh, but somewhat similar if you think that you're worried about pseudomonal activity. Um, in that case, it would be rather similar. Uh, but one unique thing for community acquired pneumonia that the Indonesian guidelines had is they actually have aminoglycoside listed there. Um, we do use that for hospital acquired pneumonias as a, as a secondary drug sometimes, but we don't like to because it doesn't get into the lung very well. You can also nebulize um, aminoglycoside. Some people do that. Um, so I showed you the common bugs that cause community acquired pneumonia in the US. This was just a study. This is, these could be people that have been in the community or maybe in hospitals recently that came into an Indonesian hospital. 
So out of 202 um, respiratory cultures, you can see what are the organisms that were isolated there. So I think, you know, you'll recognize that strep pneumo is there. Uh, Klebsiella pneumoniae we can see in the US, but it's rare. Uh, that's a more common organism in Southern Asia. You also tend to see more Acinetobacter. The strep viridans though, uh, that can actually just be in the, in the oral cavity. So that may not be really causing a pneumonia. And then, you know, there's some other organisms there. So, you know, you can't really identify atypical organisms easily in the lab. So a lot of times that's an empiric uh, a decision whether or not somebody has it. There are some tests out there that might help you decide if someone has an atypical. Um, this, I think, was an interesting slide. So from that same set of 202 isolates, they found ones that were resistant to like three classes of drugs. So there were 44 of them. And this is just a slide showing you what the resistance profile looked like. Um, so, you know, the bigger the dark bar, the more resistant uh, to the drug uh, a lot of the organisms were. So I just thought it was an interesting, you know, if, if your faculty wants to have you look at that, they can. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to cover it in any depth, though. It's kind of worrying, though, seeing these. Right, Dr. Slane? Yeah, now, a lot of um, these, look, remember that the data that was in this particular study, a lot wow. of the folks had acinetobacter. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that those were truly causing the pneumonia. They could have just been identified in a secretion in sputum. It could have been colonization. And we know that that organism is multi-drug resistant, which is reflected in this slide too. I see. It's worrisome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dr. Slane, could you please, uh, I'm gonna go over super quick. I think we still have the HAP, right? Yeah, uh, if you can go back to the slide where uh, aminoglycoside, not really yeah. recommended for CAP, yeah, that one. Um, jadi salah satu yang paling digarisbawahi di sini, kalau kalian perhatikan, whenever, kapanpun Dr. Slane bilang CAP, CAP, itu merujuk pada community acquired pneumonia. Dan dalam penanganannya, uh, aminoglycosides, atau dalam bahasa kita, kita bilangnya aminoglikosida, itu tidak direkomendasikan, not recommended for uh, CAP treatment. That's the highlight of uh, this slide and the previous one. And then, um, yep, in, this is the, you can go to the, this website if you are interested in knowing more. And then next slide, please, Dr. Slane. Uh, ini adalah comorbidities yang pasiennya punya. Jadi kalau kita di clinical setting, kalau kita sebagai pharmacist, uh, kita tanya pasiennya, do you have, apakah kamu punya uh, COPD, uh, congestive heart, heart failure, kamu punya penyakit-penyakit ini, maka mereka membutuhkan perhatian yang lebih karena memang mereka uh, untuk masalah outcome, mereka lebih tidak bagus. begitu. Next slide, please, Dr. Slane. Uh, ini ada risk factors, ya. Sekali lagi, faktor-faktor yang faktor-faktor uh, resiko untuk MRSA, MRSA, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, or Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Nah, ini uh, yang sudah tadi dibahas, ya. Faktor-faktornya pernah dia kena MR, dia pernah kena MRSA, dia kemudian juga uh, apa namanya, pernah di oh, pernah kena Pseudomonas aeruginosa, dan ini bahaya. Kenapa? Karena kalau uh, MRSA. Uh, MRSA atau Pseudomonas itu susah dibunuh. Oke, okay? jadi memang uh, makanya menjadi perhatian khusus. Makanya kalau kita sudah tahu mereka begini, maka pada waktu penanganannya harus lebih hati-hati. Next slide, please. Next slide. Uh, Carbapenem resist, uh, resistant acito, Acinetobacter bumani. Uh, ini yang banyak di Asia, di Indonesia salah satunya. Jadi memang harus kita hati-hati dan Carbapenem ini masuk kategori obat yang kelas-kelas atas. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Slane, but I would say carbapenem is one of the, you know, like high-class antibiotics that we sometimes skip, you know, for later treatment if we have to. So, kalau misalnya, if the patient's already got this, 
there you go. You know, ini harus menjadi, you need to pay attention more. Something like, kita harus perhatikan lebih baik lagi. Next slide, please, next slide. And then, the, ini yang empiriknya ya, kalau outpatient treatment, uh, kalau tidak ada komorbiditas, No comorbidities, risk factors at, uh, for MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, saya sebutkan kembali agar diingat, uh, ataupun Pseudomonas aeruginosa, maka pilihannya untuk yang outpatient, yang tidak dirawat di rumah sakit, kita pakainya amoxicillin, the doxycycline, macrolide, uh, macrolida itu mudah-mudahan sudah masih ingat ya semua uh, macrolida seperti apa, itu uh, erythromycin, dalam bahasa Inggris erythromycin, kemudian ada uh, azithromycin, itu pilihannya. That, those are the options. Kemudian comorbidities, um, kalau dengan comorbidities, maka harus kombinasi. Ada amoxicillin clavulinate or cephalosporin, tadi disebutkannya golongan cephalosporin, uh, ceftriaxone, dan lain-lain. Kemudian and, dia dikombinasi dengan macrolide atau doxycycline. doxycycline. Uh, atau misalnya kalau memang mau monoterapi, satu terapi, maka kita uh, gunakan fluoroquinolone. Contohnya le uh, levofloxacin. Next slide, please. Next slide. Um, this one, ini sama ya, ini empiric therapy. Again, empiric. Ya, ini bukan yang spesifik. Jadi uh, hanya, it's this, this is just empiric again. Ini ada listnya, jadi beta-lactam yang sudah di, in, you know, di red, Uh, boxes, itu bisa kalian lihat. You can read it yourself. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, this is our uh, guideline. However, ini adalah guideline kita, tetapi it's been a while ago. It's uh, 2003. Uh, I believe it has been updated or at least kayak sudah di uh, upgrade atau apapun lah namanya. Tapi uh, It's more or less pretty similar to what we have here in the US. Dia mirip-mirip uh, konsepnya begitu. Jadi beta lactam dulu, tambah beta lactam as inhibitor tadi ya, amoxicillin sama sulbactam atau uh, second and third generation of cephalosporin yang kayak generasi kedua ketiganya cephalosporin itu harus ingat ya. Uh, seperti apa ceftriaxone dan lain teman-temannya. Kemudian pilihan ketiganya fluoroquinolone. Uh, macrolide itu additional antibiotic. Kalau atypical Kemudian ada yang intensive care, ICU, itu pilihan yang uh, in the lower box. Next slide, please, Dr. Slain. Um, yeah, this is the report. Ini laporan dari uh, rumah sakit di Indonesia. Next slide, please. Uh, ya, yeah, uh, ini data dari Indonesia tentang uh, MDR, multi-drug resistant bacteria. Um, tapi seperti tadi saya tanya, I asked Dr. Slane about this. Uh, we need to be careful when in seeing this data. It could be, um, kayak misalnya ada kayak acetin, ace, it's just so hard for me to pronounce it, ace, acetinobacter uh, bakteria. Jadi memang, uh, so it's not really, you know, uh, it does not come from the lung, tapi bisa jadi dia kayak upper begitu. Jadi dari mulut, you know, jadi maksudnya ini harus hati-hati. Tapi ini data yang kita kita punya di Indonesia. I uh, believe the next one is yours. Ya, yeah. yeah. okay. uh, I will just catch up later once you finish everything. I would say so yeah. we can go to the discussion. This is just a slide of what is called an antibiogram. Um, you may have seen this before. Every hospital makes a chart like this. It just lets you know what have you seen in terms of rates of resistance in your hospital or within your local community. So um, this should impact also what you might choose in certain patients' pneumonias when you're making empiric decisions. Um, don't worry about this slide at all. Uh, it's talking more about that controversial aspiration, the macro aspiration, ignore that. So We're gonna, the last thing in terms of pneumonia, like we'll really talk about will be hospital associated pneumonias, okay? And there's two different types. One is hospital acquired pneumonia, meaning it's the symptom onset happened after you've been in the hospital for 48 hours or ventilator associated pneumonia, which means a patient has been on a mechanical ventilator uh, for, at least 48 hours before developing signs of a pneumonia. 
Um, these are just risk factors. So nothing there should really surprise you. Um, being put on mechanical ventilation is a huge risk factor for getting pneumonia and I'll show you why. Um, this is just showing you that the organisms that cause pneumonia can differ. The longer you're in the hospital, the, the more scary, more resistant bacteria you may pick up as opposed to early in your hospital stay. That's all this slide is showing you. So early on, you might have more strep pneumo, which you would get in community acquired H flu, maybe some methicillin sensitive staph. But once you've been in the hospital for, for um, like three days or so, uh, then you're gonna start to see a greater percentage of these more scary resistant bacteria. So this is a patient picture of a person put on a mechanical ventilator to help her breathe in the ICU. And uh, you can see the ventilation tubes here and she has a nasogastric tube going in as well. So when someone gets put on mechanical ventilation, they're intubated. And this, this shows you an endotracheal tube that's put in and a balloon is inflated to keep it lodged in, um, in their airway, okay? It's lodged, it gets under the epiglottis the epiglottis is pushed out of the way and the balloon inflates. And then that is hooked up to a mechanical ventilator that breathes for the patient, okay? So remember that I told you a lot of organisms enter the lung by secretions, upper, upper airway secretions, gastrointestinal tract secretions. So if you can imagine, this is, oh, this is the ET tube going down that person's throat. The cuff is the balloon holding it in place. So the epiglottis is pushed out of the way. So any oral secretions in, the, in a person's mouth or throat, they can, they can trickle down here and get on top of the balloon there. Um, secretions from the GI tract can come up and get there too. And as the patient moves or as the... Uh, the, the ventilation modes can be very vigorous. Uh, organisms can get around the balloon and go straight into the lung. And this bypasses a lot of those host defenses, the gag, the cough reflex. So now organisms can get into the lung very easily, okay? Uh, so there is a question here, uh, Rudy, can I address that question? Yeah, sure. Okay. If a student will have to ask it, I think. Um, how can I see it? Because I don't think you have chat. Yeah. Gaaldi. Wait, did you say that you saw a question popping yeah, up? Raised hand happened. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, yeah. So someone, ada yang angkat tangan? Silahkan. Um, I don't think no one, uh, someone raised right hand. Okay. Oh, okay. I don't oh. okay, I will proceed. Okay, so um, this is why, you know, somebody on a mechanical ventilator has higher risks of getting a, a pneumonia. So keeping somebody on a mechanical ventilator, the longer you do that, the greater their chance of getting um, a pneumonia. It's really uh, problematic. Um, in our country, I would be willing to bet that we tend to have more patients on mechanical ventilators overall than in Indonesia, but I could be wrong. Um, okay, what do I wanna say here? Um, I think I've made the point that a lot of times, you know, people look like they have a pneumonia and we might find a bacteria and we might send it to the lab and it might look really resistant, but you have to, judge, is this just colonization of the upper airway or is this causing a pneumonia in the lung? This is a very big thing that we do. A lot of pharmacists are involved in antimicrobial stewardship, working with the physicians to decide whether or not somebody needs to be treated. Um, 
I won't get into too much detail though on this slide. You don't want to just throw antibiotics at patients or they'll get resistant eventually. There is a IDSA guideline for hospital acquired pneumonia. This is the citation. And that guideline also just looks at people that are at higher risks of, of more resistant bacteria or worse outcomes. You don't have to memorize this slide. I think focusing on more community acquired would probably be more important for this audience. Mm -hmm. um, and the guidelines for empiric treatment, you know, tend to be two or three drugs. So hospital acquired pneumonia, we will give them usually an anti-pseudomonal drug like piperacillin tazobactam or cefepime uh, or levofloxacin. Um, if they're at a higher risk of, of um, more resistant bacteria, we may give them a combination of two of those drugs. If we're worried about MRSA, we will add on either vancomycin or linazolid. Um, I, I'm really just summarizing this up in very simple terms. It's a very busy slide. That's the approach for a lot of hospital acquired pneumonia for empiric treatment. A lot of people mm -hmm. with hospital pneumonia, we find bacteria and we can usually um, de-escalate to what we need. Somebody on ventilator associated pneumonia, we will typically give them a drug for MRSA, which would normally be vancomycin or linazolid, or we, and we would give them an anti-pseudomonal beta-lactam, and we would also give a third drug, which would be either a fluoroquinolone or an aminoglycoside. Uh, this is a place we would use them. Um, these are just preventative measures. Don't worry about them. Um, nowadays, we treat, in the US, we treat a lot of people with hospital-acquired pneumonia uh, shorter than we used to. We used to treat people for two weeks. Now, uncomplicated hospital-acquired pneumonia would get a treatment of seven days. Uh, and that came out of a, a big study in France. Um, Rudy, do the students know much about pharmacokinetics? Is this something I should go over or should not? Uh, I would suggest you not to. Um, if you can, you know, like in general, uh, I think I also like brought up the idea of we would like you to explain in general terms, like what pharmacists, what U.S. pharmacists do in, in infection disease management. And one of them is the, um, you know, uh, the TPN and then, um, you know, a few other things that you, you have detailed slides for in explaining that. So if you want to go over it super quick and then like bring up like some general ideas, that'd be great. Well, therapeutic drug monitoring of yeah, TDM sides and vancomycin. This is something that, you know, our hospital has over, believe it or not, I think there are 200 pharmacists that work full-time and part-time at, at Ruby Memorial Hospital, which is huge amount. And almost every hospital pharmacist does uh, dosing and changing of dosing and monitoring of levels of vancomycin and aminoglycosides. Um, and that's something that's very common in big hospitals in the US. The doctors don't even often dose them, they'll say pharmacy to dose. So that is a very common role for clinical pharmacists in, in uh, the bigger US hospitals. So there are just, there, the slides I have here are just guidelines for therapeutic drug monitoring. Uh, we don't have to go over them, but they're there for the students to look at. Um, one thing that has in, in, uh, happened more recently with vancomycin dosing, we used to do for pneumonia, we would want uh, trough measurements of vancomycin to be between 15 and 20 to treat a pneumonia, like a MRSA pneumonia. Um, we still will do that, but ideally we're now doing it at some hospitals are doing more complex pharmacokinetic evaluations. And this is all done by the pharmacists where they're calculating the area under the curve over MIC and they want that ratio to be 400. Uh, or better. And there's a lot of positive outcomes that have been associated with that. Um, those were the things that I had in terms of these slides. Um, so the pharmacists are really involved with that. Um, so 
at our hospital and many hospitals, there are pharmacists that round with the physicians on key teams, like the, the internal medicine team where a lot of these patients are admitted to the hospital. Uh, my team is the infectious disease service. So we tend to see a lot of the, the harder to treat, more complex patients. Um, patients that go to the intensive care unit, there may also be intensive care pharmacists involved in their care. There are, what has grown in America in recent years is in the emergency departments, a lot of patients come into the hospital via the emergency room. Uh, there are more emergency room pharmacists now than there have been. That is a growing profession. Um, and they sometimes are, will recommend some antibiotics to the, to the doctors there in the in emergency room. Um, uh, pharmacists are just doing so much in the US. Um, you know, we can prescribe certain things on protocol. We can change doses without calling a doctor. Um, we can stop antibiotics after so many days if a physician doesn't, you know, say to the pharmacist or the stewardship service to keep it. Uh, so antimicrobial stewardship is a big role for pharmacists in the hospital. And a, a lot of times it has to do with pneumonia patients. Um, in Indonesia, do they have home intravenous services where people get um, IV at home? We might, uh, but not really so much done, I would say. Yeah, I think you might have some places where it happens. Mm -hmm. uh, where they can and get somebody out of a hospital, send mm -hmm. them at home with their family, and some uncomplicated intravenous antibiotics a family can administer uh, like with a pump. So that's a, that's a growing role for pharmacists here in America. Um, we yeah. actually have three pharmacists uh, that are doing that at Ruby Memorial Hospital. They're coordinating people going home on antibiotics and monitoring their labs. Uh, Dr. Slane, just want to clarify about the number that you brought up uh, previously about two, so more than 200 pharmacists being employed uh, at Ruby, but like that number, do they full-time and? Full-time and part-time. Some of them might only work like one day a week. Got it. So full-time and part-time. Um, so do, do these pharmacists, oh, excuse me, does this number include uh, the outpatient pharmacies? The clinic, the clinics that are connected to the hospital, it will include them, yeah. Okay, okay. So basically like this number is basically like for all pharmacists. Yeah, but it's a very big number. <laughs> it is, it is, it is, it is, it is, yes, yes. Yeah, we don't, we don't really have that many. Uh, yeah, I just want to clarify that because I want to translate properly. Um, uh, yeah, do you have anything else to present? Um. No, I, I kind of wanted to hear what else you wanted to, what they wanted to hear about. <laughs> okay, okay. No, I think uh, that's pretty much it. So the general concepts of pharmacotherapy of pneumonia, and then um, we just kind of concluded the presentation with what actually U.S. pharmacists do in terms of the infectious disease management. And um, yeah, I will wrap up the presentations before we go to the Q&A session. If you could please go back to the HAP, um, the, yeah, uh, we can skip that. Uh, nosocomial, yeah, teman-teman, this is another, ini adalah uh, contoh lain, uh, uh, sorry, jenis uh, pneumonia yang lain. Jadi tadi itu ada community acquired CAP atau CAP, community acquired pneumonia, dia didapatkan, acquired itu artinya didapatkan ya, dapatan. Jadi didapat dari luar atau yang ini yang sedang dibahas ini adalah nosocomial. Jadi dia dalam healthcare facilities ya. Jadi yang dalam uh, dalam konteksnya ada yang hospital acquired. Dia terjadi setelah 48 jam 
atau lebih setelah dia masuk rumah sakit admission. Kemudian ada yang yang kedua itu adalah VAP. Jadi ventilator associated pneumonia itu tipe yang kedua dari nosokomial pneumonia. Itu terjadi setelah 48 jam. Uh, next slide please, next slide. Uh, ini uh, risk factors-nya uh, sudah tadi ya jadi kalau dia usianya lebih tua, kemudian imunosupresi dan seterusnya uh, You guys, it, it's very you know self-explanatory. Itu dia menjelaskan diri sendiri. Uh, next slide, please. Then this is VAP. Uh, ini harus hati-hati juga. Dia banyak menyebabkan orang meninggal. Patogenesisnya, uh, yaitu dia kolonisasi uh, dari aspirasi yang kalau dikasih prosedur ya. Sama ada tadi M, uh, apa namanya? Kita hati-hati kalau misalnya ada MSSA, MSSA. That stands for methicillin sensitive staph. By whenever Dr. Slane says staph, that stands for staphylococcus uh, aureus. Yeah, M S S A M S S A H influenzae and then uh, S staphylococcus pneumoniae. In ini these are ini adalah tipe-tipe bakterinya yang 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 sering me mengenai uh, VIP. Kemudian late onset itu dia greater setelah three days dia uh, tiga hari. Uh, ini kalau setelah tiga hari maka yang dikhawatirkan makanya kita jaga-jaga ini yang mungkin bisa menginfeksi adalah MRSA. I repeat again, it's methicillin resistant staph aureus. Kemudian ada Pseudomonas aeruginosa, acid acinetobacter, uh, enterobacter as well. Next slide please, Dr. Slane. Um, ini gambarnya orang tadi. Next slide please. Yep. Uh, ini caranya pasang ini ya. Uh, apa namanya yang kalau untuk uh, prosedur ventilator. Next slide please. Uh, I'll, I'll just skip this. Um, they already imagined that in, in mind. Nosokomial pneumonia pathogen identification. Ini bagaimana kita mengidentifikasi uh, patogennya, ya bakteri penginfeksinya. Um, ini lumayan bisa diisolasi, uh, dia punya jenis mikroorganismenya, tapi uh, biasanya pakai bronkoskopi. Dia dimasukkan kayak tadi ya, uh, Dr. Slane already showed you how like that uh, bronkoskopi works. Jadi dimasukkan ke, ke, ke saluran nafasnya, respiratory tract, dan seterusnya. Uh, bisa juga... Uh, Salah satunya yang terakhir itu MRSA swabs. Jadi diambil apusannya swab uh, pada waktu stewardship effort. Uh, stewardship. Uh, next slide please. I didn't go into the swab. I didn't discuss the swab method but <laughs> Yeah. This, I just I mean they can always re, you know read it more yeah. if they want to. And then uh, this is one ini adalah artikel tentang uh, apa penanganan HAP. Jadi hospital acquired pneumonia and VAP, ventilator associated pneumonia. If you guys aren't interested, just go Google it. You have the, the PDF of the slide. Um, next slide, please. Ini yang harus kita hati-hati ya. Ini faktor-faktor resiko untuk MDR, multi-drug resistant pathogens atau bakterinya. Uh, kalau untuk yang VAP, pernah ini dibaca dibaca sendiri ada intravenous antibiotic use uh, selama 90 hari, kemudian ada septic shock dan seterusnya. Jadi ini silahkan dibaca. This is very important. Please go over it yourself. I don't think that we can, you know. Can someone mute everyone? I wish I could see. Yeah, next slide please, take a slide. I think Yeah. Oh, yeah. The, this is basically basically the last uh, part of the HAP and VAP um, section of the presentation. Ini empiric therapy untuk HAP or hospitalized acquired pneumonia. Um, pilihannya yang di depan sini ya. Jadi piperas dentazobactam and so on. Um, again, whenever you guys are in the clinical setting, then you have to be knowledgeable about these um, combinations and then the options. I actually, oh yeah, I have one, I already have one questions um, from the student who wants to ask about this, but I will uh, keep it for later for the Q&A session. 
And then next one, uh, next slide, please, that is lame. This is for VAP, same thing, empiric therapy. Okay, next slide, please. I didn't talk about that. Yeah, that, that's pretty much uh, it, I would say. Therapy seven days in, in some uncomplicated nosocomial. Yes. For uh, untuk menangani nosocomial pneumonia itu ada uh, seven day, ada tujuh hari, ada yang empat belas hari. Nah, uh, the last very crucial point that we would like to inform you guys, yang harusnya kita sampaikan tentang the roles of pharmacist in the clinical setting. So some points that I wrote down, ada point-point yang saya sudah tulis di sini adalah kalau di rumah sakit uh, apa sini ada namanya WVU Medicine yang uh, Ruby itu nama rumah sakitnya jadi we have more than 200 pharmacists uh, lebih dari 200 apoteker dipekerjakan being employed di rumah sakit dan uh, sebagian dari mereka uh, apa namanya ditugaskan untuk Bagaimana mengevaluasi penggunaan obat secara langsung kepada pasien? And then, um, yeah, about like the, the, the role of pharmacist, Dr. Stein, I'd like to uh, tell you that I actually have a friend uh, at Ruby. He's a hospitalist. Uh, he's doing internal medicine. And then uh, he said that himself, that he's so, how to say it, he's so proud. He's just like, He's amazed with what pharmacists do, um, you know, in 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 the uh, clinical setting at Ruby. So, yes, it's the you know um, testimony. It's there. So, yeah. Jadi teman-teman di sini farmasisnya megang banget lah intinya. Terus ada even right now in, in emergency room, uh, pharmacists sekarang mulai dipekerjakan. Gila kan ya, sampai ER di UGD, UGD juga apoteker sudah mulai di, digalakkan. Sudah ada banyak yang diperkerjakan. Di sini kita punya tiga apoteker untuk gawat darurat. Kemudian ada uh, di sini bisa kita meresepkan, tapi sesuai protokol. Uh, I just told them that like here pharmacists are allowed to prescribe in the context of uh, what we call CDTA, Collaborative Drug Therapy Agreement. Um, atau ada yang protokol, there is a protocol that we have to follow. So that's a whole different discussion, I would say. And then um, mengganti dosis, kemudian uh, we can stop antibiotics um, if needed, kemudian uh, stewardship, and then, yeah, in general, um, peran farmasis di Amerika itu Bagaimana ya? Saya bermimpi Indonesia. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing Indonesian pharmacists, you know, going forward to, you know, what we already have here. Yeah, we're working on it. Yeah, saya sangat berharap uh, pharmacists, apoteker-apoteker di Indonesia bisa lebih baik seperti mengarah ke, ke sini yang mereka sudah uh, lakukan. Um, tapi memang kayak tadi banyak sekali. Uh, apa namanya? peran-peran yang kemungkinan mungkin di Indonesia kita belum terlalu punya. Ada yang sudah kita punya uh, di stewardship, ya visitor, round, kemudian ada ada morning report. Uh, so Dr. Slane, when I did my clinical pharmacy degree, I did um, so four clinical rotations, so pediatric, geriatrics, um, ICU, and oncology. And in Indonesia, we do have some type of like morning report discussion and then like stewardship and some stuff like that. However, I believe they're not really applied, you know, in like small hospitals. You know that. Uh, it's just like big hospitals, they have the resources. So, the, you know, the hospitals that I did my clinical rotation at, we, we, we did some of, the, some of the things that we did, we just mentioned previously. Yep, that's all it. I'm uh, so happy that we've, uh, you know, we come to the Q&A session. Um, please feel free. Uh, tolong teman-teman, uh, turn on your camera, then unmute yourself. If you have questions, uh, feel free to just, or maybe you can raise your hand. Um, but yeah, and uh, the slide-slide yang setelah ini, Dr. Slane presented um, 
some details about I, I, I saw like some pharmacokinetic curves, um, graphs and everything. You guys can go over it yourself. I don't think that we are going to discuss it here. Kita tidak akan bahas itu di sini begitu. Ini salah satu peran apoteker di rumah sakit mengevaluasi penggunaan vancomycin, kemudian beberapa aminoglycosides, beberapa aminoglikosida yang kita punya. Yap, uh, silahkan. Uh, ya, sebelum ada yang bertanya, saya akan uh, tanya dulu Dr. Slain. Uh, so, Dr. Slain, uh, there's a question. Oh, this is a very good one. Um, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. Um, okay, translations going. Um, yes, I get it. So basically, so you've presented, you know, like, for example, for the CAP, for the CAP community acquired pneumonia. So, so we do have like options. And then um, from one pharmacological, you know, drug class to another, how exactly, how exactly we choose as the first line Like, do they play, um, oh, wait, are they placed on the same level to be chosen as the antibiotic being given to the patient? Or how exactly, um, you know, these are antibiotics being determined to be recommended for the physicians to the yeah. patients? I under, yeah, I understand. So like in this empiric decision here, yes. You know, some guidelines will will talk about a preference for one treatment over another in some situation. Okay. Um, so it really depends. Uh, you would consider prior uh, allergies. If someone is penicillin allergic, we wouldn't okay. give a beta lactam. We would choose like a macrolide or doxycycline, for example. Um, okay. I mean. Some of the guidelines that I've shown you today don't give a preference automatically unless there's something unique like an allergy or something like that. I will tell you that at the, the bottom of this slide here where you can see the option for monotherapy with a respiratory fluoroquinolone, mm -hmm. um, a lot of people put that as a second line because okay. we worry about overuse of fluoroquinolone. So I've really given just a, a simplified version. Um, mm -hmm. I think if you want more details, you really have to read the guidelines, um, you know, to understand if some situations me, uh, make one choice better than or preferred over the other. I see. But they everything I showed you could be a first line empiric. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh... Jadi yang barusan saja saya tanyakan adalah sebenarnya ini kan kita punya banyak uh, options ya. Jadi ada banyak antibiotik di tadi dari untuk CAP ada sekitar lebih dari 10. Jadi bagaimana cara kita memilih? Jadi uh, pertama uh, we actually have algorithm uh, atau guidelines. So if you know uh, if you want to know more, go to the detail guidelines. Then they must have like some flow. Um, or you know algorithm how to pick the best quote unquote yang yang uh, apa namanya antibiotik terbaik untuk pasiennya tapi in general kalau misalnya ada pos ada antibiotik yang satu level atau kita kayak yang mana yang lebih baik kita uh, there are some things to be considered ada beberapa hal yang harus kita pertimbangkan mulai dari uh, allergy Uh, pasiennya alergi atau tidak? Kalau misalnya dia alergi terhadap golongan penicillin, then kita hindarkan penicillin. If the patient is allergic to um, beta lactam um, derivative antibiotics, kita kita hindarkan. We have to avoid that type of antibiotic, something like that. Uh, but basically, if you want to if you want to know more, um, some things already are being recommended on the guidelines. Yep, that's all it. Itu uh, kita akan bisa diskusikan lagi di sesi lain ya. Tapi kalau ada, if you guys have questions, please raise your hands. Um, langsung bertanya. If you don't feel confident in speaking English, 
Dr. Slain will try his best. If you want to use English, feel free. Um, don't be shy. But if you prefer to use Bahasa, you're more than welcome. Yep. Uh, silahkan adik-adik sekalian bertanya. Ada ada yang mau bertanya? Or you can uh, send the questions via WhatsApp. Um, unfortunately, we don't have chat room in this meeting, so we might have to improvise. Anyone? Uh, Uh, there is a raised hand there. Okay, Putri Aulia Arta. Yep. Uh, okay. Uh, hello and good night, Dr. Slain. Uh, my name is Putri Aulia Arta, and first of all, I'd like to thank you for the lecture, which is incredibly uh, insightful. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, you said earlier that a pneumonia patient may have a multi-resistance uh, antibiotics. Uh, so, as a pharmacist, what can we do to prevent this situation? Thank you. Okay. Wow, that is a great question. <clears throat> Some of the biggest problems actually occur by people taking antibiotics when they don't need to or taking too broad an antibiotic that they can just buy at a market or a, a community drugstore. I I don't know how well Indonesia controls non-prescription so well. antibiotics. Not so well. I think that you can get pretty much anything you want. Uh, and that's not narcotics, problem. though. I just want to clarify that. Uh. <laughs> I'm not. Yeah, tonight we're not talking about narcotics. <laughs> antibiotics are a problem because they're everywhere, and in in your part of the world, there are a lot of counterfeits too. Um, you know, and we've seen people use different antibiotics labeled as other antibiotics. Um, so all those practices are bad. If pharmacists can get involved in controlling and limiting access, you know, to people that really don't need them, that's a good idea. Um, pharmacists can really help impact multi-drug resistance that way. Um, if Hospitals can also get some newer lab, micro lab tests that can help limit um, broad spectrum antibiotic choices by giving some quick information, what we call rapid diagnostic tests. That can limit um, multi-drug resistance by using less broad spectrum antibiotics um, early on. Now that's not so much what pharmacists can do, but that's, I mean, certainly what hospitals can do. But pharmacists can help by really just good sense of, of checks and balances, people that, you know, haven't been properly examined, you know, maybe question prescribers to see if somebody needs an antibiotic at all, uh, or can they use a narrower spectrum antibiotic? I mean, these are some things that they can ask the prescribers um, and that could help lessen some of the multi-drug resistance. Okay. Yep. Uh, I know that Putri Aulia can totally understand what Dr. Slane just said, but for um, other students, jadi intinya um, we, kita bisa meng, membantu mencegah terjadinya resistensi antibiotika ini uh, dengan cara, kalau di Indonesia ya, itu jangan sampai kita gunakan antibiotika sembarangan. Pasien juga Uh, apa namanya kadang main beli-beli di apotek asal-asalan begitu jadi upayakan uh, antibiotika penggunaannya itu dipantau oleh orang yang berwenang jadi dokter itu meresepkan di Indonesia kemudian jangan sampai asal-asalan main pakai begitu kemudian juga ada counterfeit ada ada kasus-kasus there are cases um, yang unik ada obat palsu counterfeit drugs jadi kadang itu juga 
um, barangkali you know as pharmacist you guys in the future um, kalian bisa bisa mengawal itu begitu uh, penggunaan obat yang benar i think uh, the last important thing about this whole pharmacist being able to you know uh, contribute to the antimicrobial resistance um, control is ini um, adherence so uh, patients can be di mereka pasien itu bisa di, di apa namanya dijaga baik-baik agar mereka patuh minum obat they have to finish the regimen that, itu uh, that's one of the big things uh, right Dr. Slane uh, in terms of antibiotic use um, adherence yeah that's a little controversial because there we like to actually newer data has suggested with some disease states we can treat for shorter periods of time and if if that is true then that creates less exposure to the drugs as long as it's adequate enough to treat the infection Got so me. i think some physicians still write for longer courses from mm -hmm. old teaching where some disease states we can actually treat fairly short now but they sh you know we want to make sure that that people are taking it for the correct amount some poor people actually might just buy partial antibiotics from markets and drugstores. That's bad, where, you know, if they only have enough money to buy like two days worth of an antibiotic, that's really bad. So if a pharmacist can make sure that that doesn't happen, that's that's a good thing. Sure. Iya, yeah, jadi tentang kepatuhan itu sekarang lagi kontroversial karena mungkin studi-studi sudah menunjukkan bahwa Uh, antibiotics are no longer, you know, like a long-term medication. Just, tidak lagi yang jangka panjang, tapi sudah mulai jangka-jangka pendek begitu. Tapi sekarang, ya itu dia. Uh, it has to be monitored. Um, tadi the the last example that Dr. Slain just mentioned about poor people, orang miskin itu kadang dia cuma bisa beli tiga tablet, four tablets, five tablets. Tapi uh, tidak cukup begitu. It's it's not adequate to treat the infection. Itu yang bisa menyebabkan uh, resistance. Okay, uh, I really hope that answer your questions, Putri Aulia. Uh, let me know if there are other um, questions from you guys. Quick question about um, the uh, right in front of us, the macrolide. Um, the question is. Uh, it's the same thing. So erythromycin, azithromycin, clarithromycin, like, do they have the exact same level in terms of being chosen, being selected for the treatment? No, um, erythromycin is not as not as broad spectrum or as well tolerated as the other two. Got it. The other two yeah. are the main ones we use. Got it. Ya, jadi uh, apa namanya yang erythromycin dibandingkan dengan azitro dan clarithro, uh, erythro uh, dia tidak menjadi uh, utama. Jadi uh, in this case untuk penanganan pneumonia, uh, azithromycin and clarithromycin are better. Um, anyone else who want to speak up? Uh, I think we can finish the, this class in the next 15 minutes. Um, let's see, depending on... If you guys no longer want to ask questions, then we can wrap up. But feel free, we will wait. We will be patiently waiting for your questions. Ayo, silahkan yang mau bertanya, mumpung ahlinya ada. Nadia Pramesti. Yes, go ahead. Uh, okay. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you for the opportunity that you give for me. Uh, now I want to ask, uh, is there a difference between the pneumonia due to coronavirus and the pneumonia that's not to the coronavirus, uh, as we know, um, sorry if I have mistaken, uh, one of the symptoms of the coronavirus is pneumonia. And then 
uh, is there a difference between the pneumonia due to coronavirus and the pneumonia, uh, the ordinary pneumonia? Okay, thank you. Um, I need to clarify things before, uh, but I will let Dr. Slane, I think Dr. Slane knows what I'm going to say, but yeah, uh, yeah, go, go ahead, Dr. Slane. Okay. Um, so I, you know, the question, I think what you're asking might be, is the presentation different between the COVID pneumonia versus what we've talked about, which has really been more of a bacterial pneumonia. You can have, interestingly, you can have COVID and then have a secondary bacterial pneumonia. So after somebody has gone through their COVID infection, their lung is altered and they can actually develop a bacterial infection on top of that. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of COVID as a presentation, some people will tend to have a lot more of other respiratory tract symptoms like a head cold, whereas some people with pneumonia don't have a lot of a, symptoms of a head cold, like sinus congestion. They have more lung focused, like with bacterial. Uh, whereas in coronavirus, they might have more of upper respiratory tract involvement. They might have other symptoms, altered taste, altered smell, um, so those are some ways they might present. Um, okay. Hopefully that, yeah. that answers. <laughs> yeah. The one that I wanted to straighten a little bit is that um, Nadia Pramesti. These two diseases are separate. These are separate diseases, COVID-19 and then pneumonia. I just, I, I just don't want them to mis, you know, understand that COVID-19 might cause pneumonia. No, um, COVID-19 is caused by another type of virus. We will talk about it later. But anyway, Dr. Slane uh, just answered that um, if Jika, the patient, um, you know, happened to have both uh, conditions, jadi dia punya COVID-19, kemudian uh, karena paru-parunya uh, rada-rada rusak um, akibat karena COVID-19, maka dia lebih rentan lagi, you know, uh, like these patients, um, they are more prone to uh, pneumonia infection. Then, uh, kalau dia dapat dua, if they have two, these two conditions, kurang lebih kondisinya sama, tetapi mungkin ada beberapa gejala-gejala khas dari COVID-19 yang bisa muncul begitu. Simpelnya sih begitu ya. Jadi ini adalah penyakit yang berbeda. COVID-19 tidak menyebabkan pneumonia, tapi memang ketika COVID-19 menyerang, dia bisa menyebabkan, dia bisa berasosiasi atau ber, kayak dibilang risk factor juga. Pokoknya dia si pneumonia itu bisa menjadi penginfeksi kedua begitu. Yep. Uh, anyone else? Uh, Nadia Pramesti, do you have any follow-up questions? Feel free. Uh, I think there's not. Thank you so much for the answer. Thank you, Nadia. Yeah, I'm very confident that we can wrap up in 10. So, Dr. Slane, I really apologize. You have to go to bed pretty late tonight. Um, no, I'm fine. <laughs> anyone else? Um, we will wait for another minute before I would let Dr. Slane you know, give the concluding um, statement, remarks, or advice, or anything. Um, please raise your hand. There you go. Salza Shahdianti. And also Setiawati Padilla. Okay, uh, silahkan unmute yourself and convey the questions. Uh, first, I want to say uh, thanks. Uh, hello, Ms. Uh, Dr. Slane. My name is Dila. Uh, I just want to ask about uh, uh, can patient pedi pediatric after hospitalization uh, with CAP can uh, vaccinate? Uh, apakah uh, pasien anak-anak 
Sampai ke Rudi ya. Uh, setelah, setelah di opname, itu bisa dilakukan vaksinasi. Uh, is your question still related to pneumonia or is it, is it like pneumonia. out of context? Tetap pneumonia? Uh, pneumonia, yes. Vaksinasi oh, okay, okay. pneumonia. Oke. Okay. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, so Dr. Slane, Dila just ask if... So can pediatric patients who just had pneumonia infection being vaccinated for COVID-19, but they already recovered? Does that make sense? So it's more, it's more of a COVID question. Than a COVID yeah, question. yeah, yeah. But yeah. Th- like the, this patient had been exposed to pneumonia. Yeah, they, they can. Um, the immune system... Uh, is fine. I mean, the COVID vaccine is not a live vaccine, so it doesn't have a lot of restrictions. Um, The dosing is important to know. I mean, in our country, as you know, Rudy, just recently the Pfizer got approved for kind of a smaller dose. So you have to make sure that you're following what what is recommended in your country and, and the proper doses. But yeah, somebody that just got over it, would be still be a candidate for the vaccine. Okay. So Dila, the answer is yes, tapi tetap harus, you, you just have to follow the protocol and then the dosing should be uh, harus tepat dan seterusnya. Yes. As long as the uh, pediatric patients, you know, have recovered fully. Gitu. Yep. Uh, lastly, I, I think I forgot her name. I apologize. Uh, who is the second student again? The very last one. I think it's a female name. Salza. So, so yeah, Salza Dila. Salza. Oh yeah, Salza Padila. If I, wait, Salza. Oh man, I'm I'm sorry. I'm butchering. The name. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Salza. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, yes. I want to try speaking English. Uh, sure. And if it's bad, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, itu. Mm. Yeah, so yeah, before my question, uh, in our country, uh, like cigarette, uh, 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 the packaging, the uh, the outside, begitu, uh, is Uh, menampilkan uh, showing uh, bad bad condition of our organs if uh, we smoking uh, yeah and maybe it maybe it for uh, to make uh, somebody uh, not to smoking uh, And I want to know about uh, your your opinion, Doctor uh, Dotslight, Doctor Dotslight. Uh, is it effective or not? Or uh, maybe we can take another way to education uh, somebody to not um, smoking. Because okay. yeah, okay. I think it's not effective. Uh, um, there is many somebody smoking I until see. now. Okay, thank you so much, Salsa, for the question. Uh, yeah, just wanna summarize. I would say so. The question is about smoking cessation. Um, it's basically one of the pharmacist efforts in terms of you know. Uh, improving um, quality of life of the uh, individuals around the uh, in the community, basically. So uh, Salza said that in Indonesia, the cigarette boxes, the cigarette packagings, like the government make the manufacturers basically depict, you know, like super bad conditions. I believe. Um, Like any type of cancer, lung cancers, and then nasal, yeah. yeah. 
yeah, nasopharyngeal um, cancer whatsoever. But Salza said that apparently it's not really effective. Uh, but that's like her opinion because we need whenever like you're you know um, informing or you know whenever you're saying something we need to based on the data and then that's uh, what she said. Um, it's not really effective. So what do you think about depicting the you know, like such a awful pictures, um, images on the uh, secret packaging. And then um, if you may, do you have any idea like how exactly the US situation in terms of the, do, the, do, do we have that? I mean, I don't smoke. I never, I never go to pharmacy or, you know, like um, Walmart or Kroger to see those boxes, whatever. So yeah, in the US, they just have words. In other countries, they have the pictures. Like I was, I was before COVID, I was in Scotland or England, and the packages there had horrible pictures. So I believe that there is some data that shows some effectiveness by doing that. Otherwise, they wouldn't do it because it's costing a lot more for them to print those that way. Um, but you know. I, I personally don't do a lot of smoking cessation counseling. In our clinic, we sometimes do. I'm not as involved in it, but I can tell you that smoking is a huge risk factor for cardiopulmonary disease, pneumonia, and many other disorders. Um, so I think it's a big thing that pharmacists can do, um, you know, because they, they can do it with family, you know, people that know that they're an educated pharmacist might be willing to listen to them. Um, if they're working in a clinic or in a corner pharmacy, um, certainly they have the opportunity to talk to patients about uh, the harms of, of smoking. So I think there's a lot you can do. We have a lot of different treatment options, you know, gums and patches and, you know, um, so there are a lot of different tools pharmacists can use. So I, I think there's a lot that can be done as far as those cigarette packages, I think there's data that suggests they work. Okay. But yep. It's not uh, expertise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, that that's Dr. Slane's answer. Salza. Um, uh, you know, some studies said that like it it works. Tapi nanti coba dilihat lagi intinya. Um, there are many other ada pilihan-pilihan lain yang farmasis can do ada yang farmasi bisa lakukan begitu uh, tentang smoking cessation bagaimana menghentikan uh, orang-orang merokok uh, diantaranya ya edukasinya mungkin ini yang tadi kamu bicarakan itu tentang apa uh, depik, uh, apa mencantumkan horrible pictures on the uh, cigarette packages itu lumayan bekerja, tetapi mungkin bisa disokong dengan usaha-usaha uh, lain oleh farmasis, khususnya counseling itu bisa begitu. But Dr. Slane also mentioned that it's not, you know, his areas of expertise. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Okay, uh, any more questions? Now it's already 10:31. Dr. Slane, do you want to stop sharing your screen? So everyone, if you can. Um, turn on your camera that would be great we really appreciate that tolong nyalakan kameranya semuanya um, apa namanya um, kita akan tutup uh, we are about to conclude this guest lecture and uh, before um, the 1031 excuse me yeah I would I would let dr. Slane to give some concluding remarks or advice, please. Um, yeah, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk with you today. Um, you know, I haven't had experience in really talking with anyone in Indonesia um, about, you know, something clinical. I, I see Rudy all the time and, <laughs> and we do talk about things, uh, but this was nice. And, uh, you know, I hope that you find uh, some of the discussion points interesting. Um, I know that it's a lot of what I talked about was really U.S. focused, but I think there may be some things that you can take with you in your career. Um, I certainly wish you all the best in your careers. 
uh, and hopefully you can do great things with your pharmacy degree. Um, also, uh, you know, in my travels, uh, hopefully someday I can even uh, uh, come to Indonesia and maybe even see uh, your university at some point. Yay, that, yeah, that'd we, be great. We, we really... we love to. <laughs> we, we, yeah, we would love to. Please do, please visit us. We have such a very wonderful list of traditional food. And um, yeah, do you know how many, so a, a very um, casual question for you, Dr. Slain. So give us a guess, how many local languages do we have? In the whole Does Indonesia, the yeah, whole the whole country. country. Your island. No, the whole country, how many local languages? We do have one national language, but yeah. Oh, I, I just want to amaze you, basically. So, 70, something like that. How many? 70, maybe? No, 832. Oh, my. <laughs> I know, I know. But, uh, like, thank God we have one national language. So, yeah. we are rich of um, cultures, and then we also have uh, lots of traditional outfits, food, Um yeah, for sure. Like I'm so going, as I said to you uh, yesterday, like going to WVU is one of, you know, like my biggest and best decision that I've made in my life. And I really hope that the relationship between Tadulaka University and here WVU will still be, um, you know, well, um, I was going to say something. But yeah, I really hope that the relationship will, will last um, forever, if possible, then I re I'm looking forward to you going or visiting Indonesia someday. Okay, uh, that's all we have for tonight or this morning for you all. Um, kami minta maaf. We apologize if there are things that are uh, yang tidak berkenan uh, disampaikan. Uh, I really hope that it then this guest lecture is very uh, informative and useful for you uh, for your future career. That's all. Um, and Dr. Slane, I will share my screen real quick. Um, yeah, this is the certificate that the Department of Pharmacy, uh, Tadulak University would like to give it to you. And then um, we really appreciate your willingness to share your knowledge and your valuable time. And like you going to bed pretty late, that's, that means a lot. Thank you so much. And I will send the certificate file via email soon, tonight or tomorrow. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'll see you, everyone. Bye-bye. Good night, Dr. Slane. Good night.